Which side are you on? 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 Cope Report, March 1972. Eight months to the November elections. This month, Congressman Charles Vanek charges the so-called value-added tax is a sneaky sales tax. And a price watcher refutes Nixon administration claims that phase two is really keeping a lid on prices. Which side are you on? 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 The evidence accumulates that the Nixon administration will propose a so-called value-added tax. Cope Report went to a machinist nonpartisan league meeting where Congressman Charles Vanek, Democrat of Ohio, charged that for workers, value-added means money subtracted. In the last four years, the administration has generated a contribution to the debt, a debt increase that is greater than all of the other deficits since World War II. 1972 is a campaign year, and 1973 is a year of reckoning. Now, I think we ought to put the cards right on the table. What does this mean? It means a tax increase somehow, some way, somewhere next year, and we ought to be talking about it today. The president should be telling us about it. The candidates for president should be discussing what they have in mind, how they're going to reconcile the difference between cash outflow and inflow in the government. Congressman Vanek described how the value-added tax works. And the president has given us a little hint. He said, in order to reduce the great burdens on property owners, people who pay taxes and have to support schools, we may have to consider a value-added tax. Now, let me tell you what the value-added tax is. I saw a little sample of it in Europe. It ranges from 6% on food to 24% on a suit of clothes. The value-added tax is a secret sales tax. It's a sales tax that is collected before you pay your sales tax. And this has the potential of increasing the taxes of the average American by over 25% or more. And I'll tell you why. This is a tax that is based on consumption. The more you buy, the more you pay. The more children you have, the more suits and dresses you have to have. The more dependents you have, the more food you need. In other words, it's a penalty tax on those who support dependents. That's what it is. A cruel hoax. This is how the congressman labels the value-added scheme. This is a terrible kind of taxation, and don't be fooled by it. The president says we've got to reduce your burdens back home. You're paying too much real estate taxes to support schools, so about 1% of this tax will probably find its way there. But he wants to get his hands on this system of taxation so that he can help bring some of the federal accounts into balance. This is his method of raising revenue to help support the government. And I think it's regressive. I think it's a cruel hoax because it's a hidden secret tax on every citizen of the United States who has to support dependents. Well, what did we do in the great tax bill of 1969? We did manage to raise the standard exemptions a little bit, and we reduced the rates for, for the average taxpayer. So he's down in his tax obligation about $100, and that didn't even make up for the imposition of new taxes to which he was subjected. The local taxes back home, the raising of the sales taxes, the raising of all kinds of other tax burdens about him. And now we're about to take that away from him through this new and this clever and this secret tax device known as a value-added tax. Closing loopholes, the congressman argues, is the most equitable way to raise new tax revenues. Now, what are we going to do to tighten the loopholes that exist? And they're all through the system. First of all, you got to talk about oil. You can't miss that. We give an oil depletion allowance for foreign extractions of oil. Of course, their biggest deal is the foreign tax credit. And the burke Hartke bill directs itself in one phase to this issue. We don't even know what the corporations are paying in taxes. 
There isn't any place that they report what they pay in taxes so that the public can get some idea of what goes on. While the American worker carries his share of the tax burden, Congressman Vanek contends that many big corporations don't. I would venture to say that if the truth were told, if we really knew, we would probably discover that a substantial number of the 500 most powerful corporations in the United States paid no income taxes, no income taxes for business year 1970. And then we get to these 112 people who made over a million dollars and paid no tax. I sit on that Ways and Means Committee. I have asked to see these tax returns. I've asked at least that they be brought in. It's un-American, in my judgment, to take a million dollars of income and pay no taxes. They're probably legal, and I'm sure that they are, because they've got good and expensive tax lawyers who appear before our committee and cry in the name of justice, and then take the law and twist it to suit their individual clients' activities. The congressman sees the flood of American investment in overseas operations as a device to duck taxation. Some of the people in the United States have a fetish. They're just determined not to pay any taxes. And they live among us as lawful citizens, claiming the rights of all citizens in a democratic society. We've got to find a way of taxing properly this great investment by American citizens in foreign countries that completely escapes the taxpayer. And the American investment in Europe today is $40 billion, and that doesn't count and include the other kinds of American investment, labeled as Bahamian, or it's Swiss money, or Luxembourg money. That is transplanted American capital, and we ought to tax it. What about the people who foot the bill for tax-dodging American industries? Congressman Vanek. The other people that ought to have some capital are the consumers. There are more and more and more and more American citizens who cannot save a dime. How much are the members of the machinist union able to save? What percentage of your total income are you able to put into savings for the purpose of capital purchases at some future date? We've got to get to the nubbins of that figure because that's the test. Whether we're surviving as a people or whether we're going to live day by day and from meal to meal and from check to check like so many people in the world must do. Congressman Vanek concluded with some specific suggestions for changing the tax laws. I think we could make up all of the needed revenues of the government by closing up these loopholes that exist. We could probably pass a law that under no circumstances in any year should a taxpayer be allowed to pay less than 10% of his income. That would mean that these fellows that made a million dollars would at least pay 100,000. It would be a help. More importantly, we could insist on some kind of a review being given on these tax returns that are kept secret. It seems to me that we ought to have some way of putting the Klieg lights on these tremendous cases of tax escape when the American people sees and can understand how these things happen. By George, the pressures will generate this year in America to put an end to it. Phase two, price controls. Are they really working? No, says Elizabeth Feinstein, director of Operation Price Watch in New York City, sponsored by state, county, and municipal workers, District 37. Price Commissioner C. Jackson Grayson stated recently that prices are being held down successfully. Appearing on the AFL-CIO's Labor News Conference, Ms. Feinstein said, I disagree with him completely. I think that he's misleading as many people as he possibly can. And we have found this by our studies and we found other supporting evidence, such as when we do our surveys on food prices in New York, we find that prices are going up at a much faster rate of inflation than the federal government finds. The State Department of Agriculture and Markets does studies in New York on food prices. They find that meat prices and grocery prices in general are going up at as fast a rate of inflation as we've ever had before. As a matter of fact, it's been very, very bad this winter. The Bureau of Labor Statistics comes out with a little summary and an analysis of their statistics in which they support President Nixon's and Grayson's statements, but then when the 
reporters on the local newspapers analyze the exact same statistics, they find that food prices are going up at a faster rate of inflation than the Bureau of Labor Statistics summary states. In other words, the government takes statistics, they work them to make their price controls look good. But when anybody else analyzes them, they don't look good at all. It's a very bad picture. What about the government's monitoring of prices? Ms. Feinstein. The Internal Revenue Service has been appointed as the enforcement arm of the price controls, and they are not able to do the job, and they haven't been able to do the job, and we've been able to find weaknesses in every aspect of their job. They don't inform businesses of what the regulations are. They don't fine any violators. They don't follow up on violations. They will, for instance, if you report an increase, an illegal increase in something in a food store, they may call the store and say, hey, have your frozen peas gone up? And the store may say, yes, and we're sorry it was an accident. The clerk made a mistake. And IRS says, OK, roll them back. And the store rolls the price back. But a week later, they will raise it again. And Internal Revenue Service never goes back to check if the price remains down. They're not able to. They haven't been given the money or the manpower or the facilities to enforce this. Ms. Feinstein talked about the games supermarkets play. One of the little jobs I've been doing is picking up the New York Post and the Daily News that carries the supermarket ads every Wednesday and compare the specials of August and the specials of September to the specials of December and January. And there's no doubt about the fact that sale prices are dropping out of meat and fish products. As a matter of fact, I brought some of the statistics with me. You used to be able to buy, for instance, uh, pork at a sale price of about 49 cents. Now this month you're finding pork specials at around 55 cents. So they still are advertising specials, but where they should be cheaper now than they were in August, their specials are more expensive. We have exorbitant increases in fish. Bluefish, for instance, was on sale at around 65, actually from around 50 to 65 cents. They are now the prices of bluefish to buy it at all started, they run from about 80 cents up to about a dollar nine. The stores are having fewer specials, fewer specials on grocery items. They have to absorb all their increased costs, and therefore the consumer loses out on specials. We also found another interesting type of deception. I found that the Frank Tea Company in Cincinnati had changed the size of the jar that they put their mustard in. You used to be able to buy the mustard for 39 cents, and you got six ounces in the jar. They have redesigned the jar, and now you get five ounces for 39 cents. They haven't lowered the price, but they have lowered the contents of the jar by about 17 percent. Is there any prospect that consumers are going to get a fair shake? Well, they aren't. It's been proven now ever since August, and I don't think that anything is going to happen in the next few months to turn things around. The government won't admit its mistakes. Which side are you on? 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 Cope Report continues on side two, designed for use at membership meetings. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. For no force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one, but the union makes us strong. Cope reports March 1972, eight months to the November elections. This month, imported goods and exported jobs, the squeeze on American workers what you can do to help win in November, and some wisdom out of Texas. For years, American workers have been caught on a vicious squeeze between imported goods on one side and exported jobs on the other, a squeeze that cost more than 400,000 American jobs and job opportunities in 1971 alone and could cost more this year. One congressman alarmed by the slaughter of American jobs is Representative James Burke, Democrat of Massachusetts. Congressman Burke discussed the problem and its consequences with Cope Report at his Capitol Hill office. The acceleration of imports over the past five or 10 years has resulted in the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs in industry and the factories throughout America. The uh, footwear, the textile, the sporting goods, the steel, the glass, you name it. 
Almost every industry has felt the dire effect on the glutting of the markets by these cheap imports. In Korea and Taiwan, they use child labor, something that was outlawed here in America over 50 years ago. A 10-year-old child in Korea will work in a factory 10 hours a day, six days a week, for as low as six cents an hour. A woman will work there for about seven cents an hour. The average pay for a man is about 10 cents an hour. This is a type of competition that the Secretary of the Treasury speaks so glibly about that we have to meet. In other words, what they're advocating is turning the clock back here in America over 50 years. We turn to the old sweatshop days, the days of 60 and 70 and 80 hour weeks, very low wages, starvation wages, and they expect the American worker to compete with this type of condition. Congressman Burke told of the exploitation of low-wage workers overseas and the effect of pay scales 12,000 miles away on workers here in America. It's regrettable that the multinational corporations in this country who are investing their money overseas should take advantage of this exploitation of human beings. In Korea, they have the fattest graveyards in the world. The lifespan of the average worker over there is about 30 to 32 years of age. He dies of malnutrition, tuberculosis, and all the dread diseases that plagued our workers 40 or 50 years ago in America. This is a serious problem, not only from a human angle, but also on the end where it affects the American worker. These multinational corporations getting their tremendous tax breaks by investing in underdeveloped countries are not doing it to help the undeveloped countries, but more to swell the profits for themselves. It would be all right, possibly, if the consumer was getting a break, but the consumer is also being gouged. I checked recently up in Boston where footwear products come in and the bills of lading indicated that the pair of shoes up there were being wholesaled to the uh, retailer for approximately $4.40 a pair. And yet when we checked in the retail outlets, we found out that they were being sold at $29.95 a pair. This is a type of gouging that's going on all over America. In other words, once they get a hold of the market, then the sky is the limit as far as the prices that they can charge a consumer is concerned. Greed, Congressman Burke charged, is behind the flight of American industry overseas. We must get a reasonable trade policy enacted in the world. America years ago adopted a minimum wage law, and that was to stop the pirating of industries from one section of the country to another. But today they are pirating the industries out of America. And America is sending over its best technological advances in machinery. They're sending over their top people over there to show them how to do it. And these people soon learn how to manufacture the goods, and uh, they do so at a very low wage. It's regrettable that greed is the guiding influence on this whole policy. There is no free trade in this country as far as our trading partners are concerned. They believe that free trade, when we open the gates for their imports to our country, but when they close the gates to our exports to their country. We could wind up as a service-oriented nation. In fact, we'd more than likely all wind up as uh, insurance salesmen selling insurance policies to one another because that would be all that would be left as far as the opportunities for the workers in America are concerned. Congressman Burke in the House and Senator Vance Hartke in the Senate are sponsors of legislation to reduce the outflow of American jobs. Write to your senators and congressmen urging their support of the Burke Hartke bill. The job you save may be your own. Cope Report attended a recent meeting of the Machinist Nonpartisan League, where National Cope Director Al Barkin spelled out the stakes in the 1972 elections and called for all out effort at all levels of the labor movement to win in 1972. We've got nine months to go before the big one. I worry about our members getting sidetracked by the phony issue. Nixon, knowing his sorry record on the domestic scene, he's going to talk about foreign affairs to make the American people forget about their troubles at home. We've got to talk about the real issue of the 72 campaign, and in my opinion, the real issue of 72 is Nixon, the man, Nixon record, his promise, his performance, his credibility. How are we going to make sure that our members 
Don't get stolen away from us like many of them did in 1968 by Wallace and Nixon. There are too many local unions that just pay lip service to politics. Too many local unions that don't have functioning political committees. Too many local unions that don't know which of their members are registered and which are not registered. That's our big weakness. Barkin had some specific suggestions for action at the local union level. We are going to emphasize the importance of local union activity, local union educational campaign. We want every local union to supplement your international, your state, your national political material with your own. There are all kinds of local issues that we in National Cope or our national organization cannot relate to. So we're looking for a national presence we're looking for a state political presence, and we're looking for a local union political presence. So take a look at each one of your local. Are you satisfied? Has each lodge got an honest-to-God political committee with the tools to do the job that we expect them to do? What kind of campaign will it be? What can we look for? Director Barkin. This is going to be the toughest, dirtiest campaign in recent history. This, brothers and sisters, is a union-hating administration. I don't care what you've got in your local unions the next nine months. Contract negotiations, strikes, arbitration, unsettled grievances. I don't care what you got in your local unions. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important to you, your union, your local, your families, your present, your future, your jobs, than the outcome of the November 7th election. Barkin urged special efforts at the local union level as the key to victory next fall. You people, I know politically you're giants, you're ten feet tall. So, brothers and sisters, let's go back to our local union. Take a look at every one of those locals. If they don't have a functioning, active committee, find one. If they don't have the tools to work with, the manpower, the money, get it. We've got film, we've got cassettes, we've got new literature that we're going to make available to you in the millions. They're for you. You've got to let us know you want it. Down deep in my heart, I believe we're going to win. Let's work together to make that wonderful hope come about. Cope Report traveled again to Texas to talk with our correspondent there about his problem nephew, Buck. Boys, I'll tell you right now, Dick Nixon ain't the only man in this country that's got peculiar notions about the way the country ought to be run. You take my nephew, Buck. Buck, he's got himself a brand new pickup truck and a double hernia, and he thinks he's smart, but he ain't. He was over at my house yesterday, and that truck had Nixon stickers pasted all over it, and he had an extra one wanted to put on my car. And I said, Buck, I don't want no Nixon sticker on my car. I'm doing my best to beat the man. Buck, he swole up and looked surprised and said, Every red-blooded American ought to support Dick Nixon. It's your patriotic duty. I uh, said, Buck, supporting Dick Nixon ain't got nothing to do with patriotism. It's got to do with politics, and Nixon's politics is a long way from mine. Well, Buck, he got mad and said, Uncle Tom, you better be careful. You begin to sound like one of them effete snobs. You go around to criticizing Dick Nixon and Agnew, and they'll make you wish you'd kept your mouth shut. They don't allow folks to criticize them. I said, Buck, let me tell you something about Dick Nixon, Spiro Agnew. You know, they work for me. I don't work for them. They come to me and my neighbors in 1968 and ask us to let them have the job of driving this old American bus. They made all sorts of promises about how well they knowed the road to peace and prosperity. Well, we give them the job. 
Now that they keep a running off the road, stalling their motor, getting lost and going down bumpy roads to nowhere, women folks nervous and the children all crying, people unemployed, I reach up and tap Dick on the shoulder and say, Dick, get back up there on the smooth road where you promised you was going to drive at. I don't want him, nor Spyro Agnew, nor you to turn around and say, get off the bus if you don't like our driving. This here American bus belongs to me and my neighbors, and Dick's just a temporary driver, and darn temporary fur as I'm concerned, Buck. Well, that really made him mad. He said, you better put one of these Nixon stickers on your car so folks won't know how ignorant you are, Uncle Tom. I said, Buck, I might be ignorant, but darn if I'm going to drive a car around town with a sign on it advertising the fact. Well, he jumps in his car and he starts up the motor and he yells out at me, Dick Nixon and the silent majority will take care of you. I said, Buck, when Dick Nixon runs his next poll on the silent majority, if he comes up minus one, it's me. This has been Cope Report for March 1972. Next month, more up-to-the-minute information on politics and the economy on Cope Report. Strong!